Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're going. So I'm asking you, how deep are you in ascending to Jerusalem? How, how important is the word? How often do you study the word to try and understand where you are? You see, there's that prophecy that talks about, are you prepared to go up to your ankle? And are you prepared to go up to your knee? Etc. Etc. The reality is, as we study the word, we start to connect spirits. We start to connect word with each other. Concepts and, and, and interesting things with the word and wells. And Yeshua standing at the temple in Sukkot turns around and he says to us, I am the living water. I am the living water. And anyone who drinks of me will never thirst again. And so if we understand that everything that's written in the word has a powerful message, it has something that we must get hold of. It's the spring that gives life to us. And we become that spring. We become this part of everlasting life. And so you read, you walk into the water in your ankles, your knees, your waist. And then you come to a place where you have to swim. And when you start to swim is when you start to read word and you start to have faith that that what you read is true and will happen. You see, when you only have your ankles in, then you can quickly pull out again and stand on the, on the dry ground. And then you don't have faith. It's that it's the depth of the water that you go to tells you where you have faith or don't have faith. And in Ezekiel 47 verses 1 to 2, we see this verse. A man went out with a line in his hand, a measure, and made me wait. And he made him go as far as he could go. Now I want you to think about that. How far are you there? If you compare these two verses, Ezekiel 47 and Revelation 22, you find the following. You find that there's a river that flows and there are trees planted next to this river. And it says to you that the water will bring life to these trees. And you'll get fruit in every month of the year and you'll get healing in the leaves. And so we see the connection. What, what John was talking about in Revelation, what the prophet Ezekiel is talking about, is an understanding that you are supposed to be that tree. You're supposed to give fruit which is different in season. There's a reason why you meet people at a specific time of your life where you have to give a certain fruit, one of kindness, one of long-suffering, one of etc., etc. You've got to meet people's needs. And this is the, the, the fact that we're talking about. Do you understand the word in this way? John 4 says, Yeshua, whoever drinks of this water again will never thirst again. It will become a spring of water welling up to everlasting life. Now let's revert back to reading this in Ezekiel 36, verse 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. You see, if you're a priest, you have to be clean. Because only when you're clean that you can decide what is clean and what is not clean. You can actually do what you're called to do. And there's a pattern to discerning your spiritual status. Are you well? There's a pattern in the Word, something which is hidden away in all of the Word that we see. Similarly, the work of obedience to Yahweh is an ascent up to Jerusalem. It's a journey that we individually must make. You have to decide to make it. No one can make it for you. It's a spiritual journey. It's a virtual journey. It's a walk up to Jerusalem. So this walk that you have to do is a pattern which is set out. And as we stop at these physical places and the events that happened at each place, I'm going to ask you, have you dealt with this? Have you considered the stop in your spirituality? Have you made these decisions at these places? Because it tells you whether you are going to get to Jerusalem or not. And you'll have to ask yourself then, how deep are you in the Word? You see, if you're only at Mount Nebo, then you're probably in your ankles. If you've crossed the Jordan, you may be under your, uh, at, at your knees. There's got to be a journey that we walk on that we can understand where we're going. And so you must decide whether, whether you have asked yourself, how deep in the water am I? Have you ever really started on this journey? Have you experienced the spiritual stages of each place? And you must decide for yourself too, if you've built up the capacity to complete this journey, it's not something you can do by car, it's something you do in the spiritual dimension. And have you words of your own to sing a song of praise? You see, it's not about the stops that you make, but it's only as you go past each stop that you get words 
words that add to the to the to the verse that you're making up. And as you get closer to Jerusalem, the verse becomes two verses. And when you get there, you can walk in and you can sing a song. And we're supposed to be singing a song today, one which says, "I'm coming to be the bride." And most women, when they want to be the bride, they choose some song that is special for them that they want to have played at that wedding. Just so does God, Yahweh. He has a special song. He wants to hear your words, your words of love, your words of acceptance. And that's a song you have to write. You have to put the words together as you come along this journey. And so here's a topic of that. The tabernacle in Jerusalem is built on the threshing floor of Mount Moriah, the lower of the two hills. The tabernacle points east, past the Mount of Olives, across the River Jordan, to Mount Nebo. This is the journey we have to make, but we make it from the other side. And so if I start, Revelation 7, 2 says, I saw another angel coming from the east, having the seal of Yahweh. God always approaches Jerusalem from the east. Every single verse that you will find tells us that. And so Yeshua, when he came up to Jerusalem that last time, would have walked this journey. His footsteps will be on this particular road. Hebrews 9 verse 28, also the Messiah, having offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time to deliver those who are equally waiting for him. And he will come and he will stand on the Mount of Olives. So it's a journey from the east to the tabernacle. That's what you've got to keep looking at. So if you turn around and you start looking east, then what I'm going to show you, there's a corridor a corridor of events, a corridor of places, of circumstances and things that happen which you have to think about in your spiritual walk if you want to ascend to Jerusalem. And so the journey that you have to make this Sukkot is this particular one. And so Mount Nebo, it's the point of entry to the land. Balaam will come here and he will try to curse Israel at three different points on this mountain. And God will tell him, you can't do it. It's the place where Moses will be buried here after he looked over the land. It's the place where Elijah will come. Jeremiah, so I'll go first. Jeremiah arranges for the utensils of the tabernacle to be buried here. You find that in 2 Maccabees 2 verse 1 to 8. But it's also the place where Elijah will come. I know I talk about Elijah somewhere else. Let's leave that. Mount Nebo. Oh no, I do. I should get the thing to work. Elijah will come here to be taken to heaven supernaturally. What do we find? We find this is a supernatural place. It's a place of meeting with God. In other words, this is a place of real born again experience. It's something supernatural. It changes your life significantly. There are many people that will tell you that it's Mount Tabor. There are people that are going to tell you these things happen at uh, Mount Hermon. But this, that, that place is up in the north. We have to be facing east and we have to be facing Jerusalem for this journey to start to take place. And so what we see, this is a holy mountain. It's something which is set apart. When you're at Barnius, Peter will come and say to you, say, uh, uh, Yeshua will come to Peter and say, Who do you think I am? In Luke 9, 28, it says that after these things, after that story, remember Peter answers and says, You're the Messiah? And then he says, on this rock, and he's not talking about pity, he says, on the promise that Yeshua is the Messiah, he will build this church. In Luke 9, 28, he says, after these things, in other words, after the story of Yeshua and Peter having that discussion, it says, they go off on a seven, eight day trip to a mountain to pray, which has been called the transfiguration of Yeshua. And the only place where that can be is Mount Deba. Mount Tabor has been occupied for ages. It's not a quiet place. Moses is forbidden to enter the land. Remember his promises? You cannot enter the land. So he has to be outside. And therefore the most likely place is Mount Nebo, the holy mountain. And the disciples also think it's a cult. Because they say to him, can we build you some booths? So this is the place where Yeshua has this, this meeting. This is the place where we start off as we come to Jerusalem. And so Luke 9 says, as he was praying, his face changed. Moses and Elijah, who both left at Mount Nebo, are there with him. 
This is the place where he starts this journey and he starts walking to the cross, starts walking to his exodus. And he says, soon I'll be finishing this. And he says, this is my son in who I'm well pleased. This is who I've chosen. Listen to him. So what we see here is we start at Mount Nebo. This is the place where we're facing Jerusalem and we start the walk. And so what you have to ask yourself is, are you ready for this? And how do we see this? When you look at Moses, you look at the story of Moses in Exodus, you see that there's, he's on a mountain. The cloud covers the mountain. A voice comes out of the cloud. You find exactly the same sort of uh, comparison with the story at the Mount of Transfiguration. And it gives us a complete idea that we keep saying that there's someone greater than Moses and Yeshua was the one that was greater than Moses. But more importantly, what we see, oh, we've got it twice. The question I have to ask you is, have you experienced this mountain? Have you come to this place where you truly give everything in your life and your heart to God? Where there's nothing left behind that looks like and experiences like the world. And so we've come, the next place is to the River Jordan. If you go down to the Dead Sea and just before you turn right, you turn left and you start going up to Galilee, there's a place, a baptism site just there which has been open for a number of years. It's a place which is of great significance because Joshua will arrive here from the wilderness and he will cross over on dry ground, something similar to the Sea of Yaf, to the Sea of Reeds. He crosses over and Elijah will end his ministry here. Joshua will enter the land here. John the Baptist will baptize Yeshua in this river. And more importantly, King David, after he's lost his kingship and he comes back into the land, comes back at the same place here. And so what do we find at the River Jordan? What's the importance of this place? What's the principle that's being asked here? The message is a change of authority. Have you been baptized in the sense of mikvah, in the sense that you declare that there's no authority from the kingdom of darkness? But more importantly, have you declared that the kingdom of this world, the money, the bars, the ashes, also have no say in your life? You see, this is a place where there's a change of authority. There are many people who are believers, but they are so caught up in the world, in their positions, their titles, their power struggles, that they have no time for being a true son of God. And so what you see is this is a message of a change of authority. And what happens here? When we change authority, you become set apart. You become someone that is different. It's a royal priesthood. But what happens here is you have to make a calling. If you were to go to that river today, I would happily go into the river with you. But I will not lay my hands on you. I'd ask you to willingly bow your knee and go under the water. And I'd ask you when you come up to make a declaration that you accept your calling, that you accept that you walk in unity, more importantly, that you're going to do whatever the Ruach asks you. This is the change of authority. You see, you cannot live in the world. There's two parts there. Live in Satan's part and live in the world part and be set apart. You've got to listen to what God wants. So it's a complete change of authority, walking in obedience to His will. And then if you come to Jericho, it's the first city conquered by Joshua. And what's important about this city, and what about this battle? It was in the time of unleavened bread. What does unleavened bread say to you? It's when for seven days we have to eat matzahs. What have you done here? This is where you deal with the giants in your life, with the things that have been catching you and pulling you down, with the generational curses and the hurts and all the wounds that you've had. This is where you deal with your past. Because you see what happens here. If you don't push down the walls of Jericho in your life, you never get to Jerusalem. And if you allow the walls of Jericho to stand up again, your city will never be Jerusalem. What do we have here? Joshua came and he pushed the walls down. And they went into Jerusalem and they built the tabernacle. And they were there for years. But at some point in time, they turned around and they started to worship idols and started to do all sorts of funny things. And God takes them out of the land and the walls of Jericho rise up again. What happens today? Do the Jewish people have authority over the Temple Mount? No. 
And the same applies to you. If you have a problem with alcoholism or with anything else in your life, any problem that you have, if you've not dealt with the Jericho, you'll never have authority in Jerusalem. And so it's important that you stand here and ask yourself, have I dealt with anything and everything in my life? Can I come to God and say, I am walking pure and holy. I'm dealt with it. I'm coming into you in the completeness of who you made me. And so Jericho is this thing again. I've already said that. We can jump. <laughs> the Judean wilderness. It's here where we see the scapegoat. He's set out during the Feast of Yom Kippur. He gets sent out with all the sin. He gets told not to come back again. We also see that it looks barren and dry. It's a place where there's no grass. But today we can see the worn paths where the people and the sheep look. It's people who walk there even though it is barren and, 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 and miserable. But it's the place in Matthew 4 where we see something very interesting happen. It's a place where Shua has to endure the temptation of Satan. And he comes to him three times and he asks him three questions. He says, will you turn stones into bread? And Satan is asking you the same question. You see, we think it was only Yeshua, but not. He's asking you the same question. He says, ask yourself, have you dealt with the material things in life? With worldly flesh? He comes and he asks another question. He says, will you jump from the highest temple? And Yeshua says to him, go and jump from your temple. But he says to you, he, to, he asks you yourself, have you dealt with your own pride and your own ego? What is important for you? What is the most important thing in your life? And then he asks the third question, he says, will you worship me? And we get asked the same question. Have you dealt with self-sufficiency? Have you dealt with every ambition for power and position? Have you dealt with these things? You see, we have to stand in that Judean wilderness. And you and I have to ask these same questions. If we are stuck on any one of these, then you and I can't go any further. We can't ascend any further. It's here where we register the event of the Good Samaritan. The road is dangerous. There are dangers on the road to the tabernacle. You could be tested. You see, and if you haven't answered these questions, you're not going to know what to say. And maybe you just fail. You know, for some people, I can drop a 10 rand note here and they will not be able to walk past it. For other people, that has to be 100,000 rand. But there's a price. And the price comes. And when that price is in front of you, you have to know how you're going to deal with it. And this is the story from the Judean wilderness. Have you asked yourself these hard questions? Think about it. We are so important in our lives. We come along and when I ask you, Good, good to meet you, sir. What do you do? 90% of the time, people will answer me and say to you, I'm the general manager of this, or I'm the... I'm some title. They seldom say to me, I'm the husband of. I'm the father of. I'm always a title. I'm owner of a business. I have my own business. I'm a self-employed man. I'm a farmer. They seldom answer something of incredible value to God. And so you'll be tested here, and if you haven't dealt with it, if you don't know where your limit is, you could easily fail the test. And so the question I ask you here is, have you looked after strangers? You see, God has taken you on this journey. And the journey of the Good Samaritan is not just a story, it's an example of something that you and I face every week. There's a stranger that you meet. And have you been good to him? Have you treated him well? Have you looked after him? And this is not about giving money. It's about looking after the needs of people. And the point is, if you haven't looked after the stranger, you don't make it to the next level. And the land of Moriah, the Mount of Olives comes. And it's here that Abraham meets up with Melchizedek. It's here that Melchizedek will come and anoint him and give him the wine and the bread. It's also the place where Abraham will sacrifice his son. Immediately after that, Yahweh cuts covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15, and then immediately after that we find the story of the binding of Isaac, the same place. So observation and notice of the word, if you're facing the western wall, you're facing east, the most likely place of the crucifixion, since it's only those who are standing here will be able to see the veil which has been torn, 
the direct line of sight from the place where Yeshua was crucified has to be from where? You have to be able to look straight in to the tabernacle. So what are we asking you here? It's a place recorded in detail where Yeshua will stand when he returns. Zechariah 14. It's also the place that we must look at the principle. What is this? The image of the donkey. And I have to ask you, are you this donkey? Are you a transformed donkey? Have you renewed your mind? Have you untied yourself from the world? Do you still cover other people's donkeys? Are you a carrier of his prophetic word? Does your character and your lifestyle bring glory to his name? Have you written your own personal version of the song of ascent? You see, when Yeshua came into the, into the city, he rode on a donkey, and we all think it's a strange story. But the reality is the emblem of this walk up here is that of a donkey. You must be carrying the Messiah. And this is the question, are you still focused and carried to the world? So more importantly, have you declared these words? Have you ever declared them? Have you declared them here? And have you declared them in Jerusalem? Blessed is he who comes in the name of Adonai. You see, when I get to that mountain, it should be part of my vocabulary. It should be part of my daily blessings. It should be something that I continue to say day upon day. The Garden of Gethsemane, we're coming closer to the tabernacle. Yeshua goes to pray in this garden. He realizes that this is in a critical time. You know, he's walked this journey. He's dealt with all of these places. And you can see there were many events at each place, but he dealt with them all. And he comes here to the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes in to pray and to ask his father, Abba, whether this is what he has to do. These are his final moments of his life. And he will speak for, for, for Yahweh with a confirmation. Is this really what you want me to do? I mean, it sounds and looks terrible. Is this what you want me to do? And God tells him, yes. And he asks the three disciples to watch and pray. But they fall asleep three times. We tend to focus on old Peter. You know, he tells Peter, you're going to deny me. And Peter denies him three times. And we focus on Peter, this bad guy. But all of the disciples slept while Yeshua was busy praying. And the question really for us here is, are you a watchman on the wall? Have the worries of the world worn you down? Are you in a place now where you are denying Yeshua, not by words, but by actions of compromise? And what I'm saying to you is, if you compromise in any way this generation, the next generation will multiply exponentially. And so if you don't set a standard, and you don't start to measure that standard, you're going to be setting it up for a generational mistake, a disaster for a legacy. And so have we compromised? Where do we compromise? What are the actions that we make that are compromised? And more importantly, if you have compromised like Peter, have you asked to be reinstated? Have you asked to be reinstated? Because if you do, he comes and he says to you, feed my sheep, feed my lamb, look after my lamb. You see, that's the principle here. But what we're asking you clearly today is, how pure are you walking in line with the principles of the Torah? Because if you're compromised in any way, you're the same as those disciples, you're the same as Peter. You're in a good, you're in a good congregation of believers, sons of the covenant. But we're in problem, diet, problem days, and we need to think about having reinstated. And so there's a crown of thorns. He's risen. Back in the Garden of Eden, mankind received, received a curse to walk and to work with thorns and thistles. Yeshua wears a crown of thorns. He takes away that curse and restores the blessing. Have you ever accepted that crown? as your part of inheritance. Have you ever said, Yeshua, I understand that you've worn the crown and therefore that curse is no longer mine to live with and I choose to accept and to find the blessings that you have for me. You see, it's only when we experience that kind of, of, of freedom that we can enter into Jerusalem. And so one new man, we get this idea, we come into Jerusalem, we're supposed to be, supposed to be living differently. And so I'm asking you, if you go into Jerusalem, are you praying for the Jews to open the hearts to the millions of Gentiles 
we must enter the new Jerusalem. You see, I can't go there and be spat upon. I must be welcomed. And so you've got to pray for a change of heart for the people that are there. They've kept the Torah. They've kept it for us amazingly. It's a wonderful privilege that we have to be able to go there. But you see, they have to welcome us because we're from all nations. And so are you praying for that change in their hearts? And their hearts are hard at the moment. And we need to understand that. And this is a prayer you should make every day and every week. More importantly, are you bringing the Messiah to, to the Jews by walking like he did? You know, it's interesting. He never came and told them they were wrong. He, if he fought with them, he said, I don't like your traditions. But he never said, I don't accept you. He came and he showed them how to do it. He came to heal. He came to feed. He came to do all of these things. He came by showing them. He reflected the work and the word. And so this is an interesting question. Is he a carpenter? The English translation says he's the carpenter of Nazareth. I'm, I'm teasing this out with you because I want you to start studying the word with passion. 90% of the time I talk about the Hebrew words. And only 10% of the time do I go to the Greek words. And it's a big mistake because the same thing is happening there with the translations. Is he the carpenter? In Mark 3 and in 6 verse 3 and Matthew 13, 55, we read these words. Is he not the carpenter? Do you believe that's what he was? The Greek word used here is tektron. A worker of wood, so a carpenter. A craftsman, a stonemason, an architect. Did he not build the greatest tabernacle, the living stone tabernacle? A writer of songs. Isn't it the most beautiful song you've ever heard? An author, did he not write the greatest story ever? You see, we are so focused on just accepting that we don't study the Word. And therefore, I ask you, how deep are you in the Word? Because it's when you go into the Word that you start to understand what it is He's saying to us. And you get released. You get a freedom that comes from that. And so you're made in the image. And that word image is... Techlem, I'm not sure how to say it. I'm not, I didn't learn Hebrew, but it's a reflected image. So if you see Yeshua as a master craftsman, as a master craftsman, then you will understand that he turns the chaos in your life into order. So that your light can shine. Amen.